Good day. For those of you who do not know us, we are the instructional staff for ECE 150, professors here in Patel and Werner Dietl, and Douglas Harder. In this topic, we're going to go through the anatomy of a program. So in this topic, we are going to define the components of a program. That is, we're going to give names to aspects of a source code in the programming language so that we can refer to them later. We're going to look at preprocessor directives, statements, blocks of statements, function declarations, and function definitions. To begin, we will start with describing preprocessor directives. This is going to be very quick. You can essentially call this one statement we see here an include directive. Now, an include directive indicates that a particular file should be included in the compilation process. Now, the C++ standard libraries contain functionality available to all programmers except perhaps those dealing with embedded systems. It is possible to include source code that someone else has written into your programs and then you can access and use this other person's programs, algorithms, and functions. If you want to see a complete list of all possible standard libraries, you can visit this website here at c++.com. All preprocessor directives start with a pound symbol. Another example is a define directive, and we will be investigating this closer to the end of the course. There are other directives as well, and invariably they are a pound symbol followed by a name that identifies the type of directive. In this course, we will focus and only really use the include directive. Next, we're going to look at statements. Now, in C++, there are two types of statements, and statements can always be, be described as either being an introduction or declaration of an identifier, or an actual action that is being performed on some data. A statement is always terminated by a semicolon. Now, here's are some examples of statements from NASA's Core Flight System Memory Manager application. You don't have to worry about what this code actually does, but you can see that there is something being done followed by a semicolon. Here specifically, this statement, which starts after the semicolon from the previous statement, actually spans six lines and terminates with the semicolon on the last line. Following that, another statement begins and that statement ends with yet again another semicolon. Now, a block of statements is zero or more statements surrounded by a matching pair of opening and closing braces. Statements are executed one at a time in the order in which they appear in any block of statements. One statement must finish executing before the next statement starts. So if we were to have this piece of code here, we see that there are, are three statements. The first one seems to print to the console, hello world. The second one, what it actually does is it prints to the console an end of line character or endlin. 
And then the final statement is a return zero statement, which we will cover further in this later in this course. So for example, the here is another example of a block of statements that appears in Nassau's core flight system memory manager application. The first statement must be finished executing before the second statement is starts executing. And so you can see how a piece of source code is meant to execute by reading the statements one at a time. Next, we're going to look at function declarations and definitions. The first thing here we see is a function declaration. This is a statement as it ends in a semicolon. This tells the compiler that main is going to be a function, and we'll discuss a little bit more about that next. Here we see a function definition. A function definition looks a lot like the declaration, but instead of a semicolon, we have a block of statements. When this function main is called, it is the block of statements that immediately follows the name in the function definition that will be executed one at a time when that function is called. Now, this body or block of statements that is executed when the function is called is also referred to as the function body. Now, from secondary school, you have seen various functions. You've seen sine and GCD. The names of these functions are sine and GCD, or greatest common divisor. In the case of sine, it has one real parameter, and the result is going to be a real value. Now here I'm assuming that the parameter is in radians, but you could also define sine in terms of degrees. The GCD has two integers as parameters, and it evaluates to an integer. Next, the function declaration indicates to the compiler that there is going to be a function with a very specific name that exists. The name of the function is also called the identifier of the function. This is what identifies the function and differentiates it from other functions. It also gives the function's parameters and it describes what it returns. So int main open and close parentheses followed by a semicolon indicates that the name of the function is main, it has no parameters, and it returns an integer when it finishes executing. You'll remember that main returned the value zero. Now, the function declaration for the greatest common divisor function would be as follows if you were to author this in C++. This is a statement, so it ends in a semicolon. The name of the function is GCD. You could just as easily give it some other name, such as greatest common divisor, but GCD is shorter and quite recognizable. It has two parameters, both of which are integers. The parameters have names m and n. It returns an integer. We expect the GCD of two integers to be an integer, not something else, like a real number. The function declaration for the sine function would be as follows. The name of the function is sine, or you may spell it sine with an e, as you wish. It has one parameter, x and that parameter is a representation of a real number. We will get more into double later in this course, although some of you may have already seen this. Finally, it returns a representation of a real number. Now, a function definition 
is the function declaration without the semicolon and instead immediately followed by a block of statements. This block of statements is also called the body of this specific function. So here we see the body of the main function. These are the statements that are executed when a function is run. The three statements executed when main is called or run include printing hello world to the console output, printing an end of line to the console output, and then returning the value zero. Now, the main function, that is, the function with the name main, is especially important in C++. There can be many functions, and we will be authoring many functions in this course. But if a source code is compiled into an executable, when that executable is run, the first thing it will do is call the main function. That is all that happens when a piece of source code is converted into an executable. If any other function is to be called, it is either going to be called from within main or by some function that is called by main or so on and so forth. Now, in addition to function definitions, declarations, and statements within the function body, we're going to have all of this made up of things such as literal data, identifiers, operators, and delimiters. Every single part of a program can be broken up into these aspects. Literal data will be things that represent actual things such as numbers, characters, and texts such as we've seen already, such as the literal integer zero and the string of characters or the text hello world. I could have changed that to hello Doug or something else, but that is literal data. We will see literal data more in a future topic. We've also seen identifiers such as main, sign, and GCD, but there's also identifiers such as standard C out, standard end of line, and the return keyword. We will look at identifiers again also in a future topic. Now, the only way to manipulate data in C++, that is, the only way to actually make changes, is to use an operator. And here is a subset of all the operators that appear in C++. Almost all of the symbols that appear on your keyboard are an aspect of some operator. And we're going to look at these later. Now, you've already seen operators in secondary school. Plus, times, divide, and minus. We're going to see many more operators in this first section. So by the end of this section, most of these operators will make sense to you. Some of these operators are binary, just like plus. Plus takes two arguments. And so many of these operators will have something on either side of them. Others take only one argument, such as n factorial, although the exclamation mark in C++ does not mean factorial. We'll look more at that later. And finally, there is actually one operator that takes three arguments, but we won't worry about that in this course. The pairs of opening and closing parentheses, opening and closing brackets, and opening and closing braces, as well as opening and closing angled brackets, are used to group expressions in C++. Now, this may be interesting because if you take a look, the angled brackets are also operators. So now, in some cases, angled brackets will be used to group expressions. In other cases, angled brackets will be used as operators. And you will have to investigate and look at the code yourself to determine 
which is the appropriate interpretation. We will call these parentheses, brackets, braces, and angled brackets. However, we may also expand it to say round parentheses, square brackets, curly braces, and angled brackets, if we want to be a little bit more clear. Now, very quickly, in your mathematics courses, you've already used these three delimiters to group your mathematical expressions. These three are referred to as opening delimiters, or an opening parenthesis, opening bracket, and opening brace. These three are the corresponding closing delimiters. These delimiters always come in pairs in C++. And when the angled brackets are being used as delimiters, they too will always come in pairs. The opening delimiter must always come before the matching closing delimiter. Also, note that you cannot mix delimiters. From secondary school, you will remember that this is a completely valid expression using order of operations, and this is very clear as to what is intended to happen. You could evaluate this expression. Now, of course, I cannot translate this directly into C++ because the standard keyboard does not have a multiplication symbol, nor does it have a division symbol. So we will have to choose different symbols than those that you learnt in secondary school or even elementary school. On the other hand, even from secondary school, you know that this expression here makes no sense. You have a closing brace before an opening brace occurs. You have an opening parenthesis before the 7, but the next closing parenthesis it's not a parenthesis, it's a closing bracket. But that doesn't match the opening parenthesis. Also, there is an opening brace, and at the end, there is an opening bracket with nothing matching it. Well, C++ is similar, and as you go throughout C++, learn C++, you will see that we do use delimiters in a similar fashion which we're going to call nested, but don't worry, we'll see a lot of that in the future. So, following this topic, you now understand what an include preprocessor directive is. You also know that all preprocessor directives start with the pound symbol. We've defined what a statement is. It is a sequence of operators, perhaps function calls, other things, ultimately followed by a semicolon. We've defined a block of statements, which is essentially zero or more statements surrounded by braces. We've defined a function declaration and function definitions. And we've introduced the concept of the various aspects of the language, including literals, identifiers, operators, and delimiters. Here's this, here are the references, acknowledgements, the colophon, and a disclaimer. Cheers!